Um, when we invented the SP445 film tank, uh, it's almost five years ago now, um, almost all of our customers had very extensive experience in analog film, processing their own film. Most of them had followed the traditional path of starting 35 millimeter, moving to medium format roll film, and then on to 4x5. So they had already picked out a favorite film, they already had their favorite chemistry. So it's just a case of them figuring out how to adapt their existing processes to a different processing tank. And yeah, that was, that was great. But what we've seen happen in the last year, and it really accelerated over this last summer um, for a variety of reasons, partly related, I think, to people being um, stuck at home more. But we've seen a, quite an increase of people who have never processed film before, and they're starting off with large format. Uh, we even have customers starting off with the tra our tray system with 5x7 or even 8x10. Uh, for, and I think there's a variety of reasons for that. But whatever the reasons are, it has become obvious to us that we need to do a video and a tutorial for those people that have never processed film before. What do you need to get started? What is the basic process? And how can you get a decent negative, you know, without stumbling around in the dark, quite literally? You know, uh, so that's what this video is all about. Now, we actually have a short paper, the step-by-step -step guide to the 4x5 film processing system, which outlines everything I'm going to tell you today. Uh, it's, I, I'm going to throw in some more of my uh, incredibly insightful editorial comments or whatever. But you can get every, you can read about it all in here, and, and uh, hopefully that will answer any questions that I leave out. So... Let's start with the hardware and the equipment you need to get started in processing your own film. Obviously, you need a film tank. You, the one thing to make sure of is that your baffles are installed correctly. You got the two film holders. Uh, you can read the user's guide on that, and you should practice using the tank uh, in daylight, loading it and unloading it and all that. The other thing you're going to need is some sort of a beaker. But 500 milliliters is a really good size, especially with our film tank. And by the way, everything I'm saying today about the film tank would apply to 35 millimeter and roll film with very, very minor adaptations. Anyway, 500 milliliter beaker of some kind. Um, there are other sizes and shapes. You'll find them like this. The problem with these long, tall ones, they're more accurate for your measurements, but they do tip over fairly easily, and they're awkward to handle. I find this works really well. These are harder, you know, this is a one liter uh, measuring cup. It's a little harder to get an accurate measurement uh, with something that's short and wide like that. You'll also need something for measuring smaller volumes of liquid, a 50 milliliter, and this is just an inexpensive plastic, uh, 50 milliliter graduated cylinder will work fine. Uh, the other thing you're going to need is a thermometer. And people get pretty crazy about temperature in the dark room. The big secret is to be consistent. You can use an old-style dial. I prefer the modern digital. Um, again, use the same thermometer every time and, and be consistent. Uh, we also recommend wearing nitrile gloves, mostly to protect your hands, but also gives you a better grip on things that, you know, wet, slippery objects that you're less likely to drop things. The other issue you're going to need is a bottle to hold your fixer at least. You may need a, a container, a 500 milliliter container to hold your, um, if you're going to reuse your developer, that's another controversial subject. We'll talk about that later. The other issue is you need a timer. Mine's mounted up here on my shelf. It's just a basic digital timer. Uh, it just counts up. It allows me to read the seconds so I know when to agitate um, anything. You can use your smartphone if you don't mind using your smartphone next to the sink. It may be worth investing in an inexpensive uh, digital timer. The other thing I'm missing is a funnel. And it's easy to overlook funnels until you find yourself spilling fixer all over your wife's bathroom sink. So that's most of the hardware. Oh, one more thing, you need hangers. I've got this fancy rack I built out of some scrap aluminum. And I use these big paper clips. And we'll clip the negatives and hang them up here to dry over the sink. There are. Um, Specially made hangers, and you can use clothespins, you know, whatever will work for that. So that pretty much covers our, the hardware that we're going to need. Let's talk about the chemistry. So the basic process here for developing the film is we need to convert the latent image that's on the negative into a visible image by 
converting those silver halide uh, atoms that have been ex or molecules that have been exposed to light, we need to convert those to solid silver. And to do that, we use a developer. And there's probably a hundred different developers out there. The truth is, they all fall into one of three categories. I'm not going to talk about staining versus solvent versus physical and, and all those different details. Especially when you get started, you're really not going to appreciate the difference. And a lot of them, there frankly isn't that much difference. We recommend our SP76EC. It's very easy to use. It's very flexible. And it's fairly forgiving. If you, try, if you accidentally overdevelop, you'll still get a decent image, something usable. Um, you're also going to need a stop bath. Now, traditionally, we used an acid stop bath. Um, we're going to use water for our stop bath. What the stop bath does is it stops the development and cleans out the tank. So when you put the fixer in, the fixer doesn't get as contaminated by the developer. The reason we can use water as a stop bath is we, our fixer that we're using, our fixer number seven, is a neutral pH fixer. It doesn't need that acid in between the developer and the uh, fixer. So if you're using other chemistry, you need to follow the instructions and the guidelines for that chemistry. After we get done with the fix, we're going to wash it, and then we're going to rinse it. We use our uh, H2O flow, which is basically a industrial grade uh, soap, basically, that gets the water to run off the negative and not leave watermarks, and then we're going to hang it up to dry. So that's pretty much the chemistry. One, two other things that you're going to need. One, it seems really obvious, and it sounds really simple, but it's not, and that is you're going to need water. Now, unless you're absolutely certain of your water quality, just go buy distilled water. Okay, so, you know, it's a buck a gallon. It, it's cheap insurance. Now, having said that, you're going to see me today using tap water. Now, there's two reasons that I'm doing this. Not that I'm too cheap to buy distilled water. We use a lot of distilled water um, for, for critical projects and other things that we're doing. But today, I'm just going to use tap water because, first of all, it's convenient. My sink here has a temperature regulator underneath it. So the water coming out of here is 68 degrees. I've got a digital um, thermometer up here that I can monitor it with. And it's just convenient. Now, I, can, I know I can use my, my tap water, and it's, it's a long, convoluted story, but basically, this building is the last water tap on the southern water line for the town of Erie. And so, they've been coming out here for years now. They come out here every month or two and take a water sample. In fact, yesterday, while we were rehearsing this and getting ready to shoot it, they showed up to take a water sample. And so they analyze our water every month or so, and we know we have really, really good water. Uh, the water treatment plant's less than 10 years old. So we get really consistent water. We've never had any trouble with it. If you have any question about your water supply, especially if you're on a well, go buy the distilled water. If you have a water softener, do not use softened water. You will have problems, and it's a process, uh, an issue we're still looking into. But we have found that the softened water uh, appears to be softening the emulsion or the gelatin on the back of the film, causing it, it can cause it to stick and the anti halation dye may not come out. Editorial comment on anti halation. Well, we'll get into that later. So, anyway, do not use softened water, um, and when in doubt, buy the tap water. One other thing, one other thing you're going to need is darkness. Now, I'm in a dark room. Before we built the dark room, though, we used this. This is a dark box, our dark box that we have the plans for. We have video tutorial on it um, uh, here on YouTube. And it's just a cardboard box and duct tape. But it's a lot easier to handle sheet film in a box like this than it is in one of those changing bags. So you can look into this. It's probably worth uh, spending an hour or two, a couple hours building. And if you can collapse it down, hide it behind your couch or whatever. So that's the intro of what we need and the basic process that we're going to go through. I'm actually going to go out and shoot some film, and then we're going to come back and show you how to develop it. Okay, so we're back in the dark room. Um, we went in the last video. Well, I guess it's all going to be one video, but uh, the other day we shot the part about the chemistry, the hardware, getting things set up. We went out and shot some film. Uh, we're back. We've got the tank loaded. The uh, couple of comments about loading the tank. First of all, read the user's guide that came with it. 
We spent a lot of time writing that user guide. I don't think anybody reads it. But anyway, make sure you get the baffles in the right order. I also recommend um, leaving both film holders in the tank as you're loading it. That way, you'll pull one out, you'll load it, and you'll put it back in. And obviously, doing this in the dark is a little trickier. Then you'll pull out the other film holder and load, load it and put it in the tank. The reason I recommend it that way is if you have start with them both out of the tank, there is the possibility that you'll cross load in diagonal corners in the tank. And in the dark, it's tricky to figure out what you did wrong. The other film holder won't go in. And it's just, it's just awkward. Um, you can always check with your fingers and make sure where that film holder is as you're trying to put the next film holder in. Um, we have videos on that. Um, you go ahead and take a look at all that. Uh, the biggest problem that we've seen with people loading the film holders is actually loading the emulsion side face down. We'll get, you know, about once a month, we'll get an email from somebody that says, I don't understand what went wrong. Some of them are a little impolite, a little rude about how awful the film holders are. And they'll, they'll say, what's wrong with my negative? And they'll attach an image. And then we take one look at it and go, is it possible you loaded the film holder or you loaded the film backwards? Nine times out of 10, we never hear from them again. <laughs> a few of them will fess up and say, oh yeah, I did load it backwards. Um, frankly, I've never done that. Um, I processed probably 2,000 sheets of film. I've never loaded it in um, backwards like that. I've made other mistakes I won't talk about, but at least I've never done that. But just something to think about. So you can look at the videos on loading the film holder. So our tank is loaded up and ready to go. Uh, make sure your fixer is ready to go. Now, the, our fix comes in a um, four ounce bottle. You mix it three plus one uh, with water. And you want to have a bottle to store that in because you're going to be reusing it. Just a quick comment on ratios. In the photography world, you'll often see things written either like we do, one plus three, or you'll see one colon three. Now, typically those mean the same thing, but there are industries, and even in the photographic literature, there are times when they mean one unit out of a total of three which is different than one plus three. Um, so we always write everything one plus 14, one plus three, or whatever. But make sure that's ready to go. You also wanna have uh, some water ready at the right temperature. I'm again using my temperature controlled faucet, so I'm not gonna have to worry about it. But if you're in an improvised dark room, you'll probably wanna have a gallon of water or so at about the right temperature uh, for your rinse. <clears throat> and then, you know, mainly for the stop bath in between and then uh, you know for the rinse and wash at the end. We'll deal with that then. But uh, a couple of comments on controlling temperature while we're talking about it. Uh, like I said, I have a temperature controlled sink, but in the summertime, uh, the water coming into the building will be at 72, 74 degrees, and the system can only warm water up, it can't cool it down. So to cool the water down then, or if I'm using distilled water that's too warm, I keep a tray of ice cubes made out of, uh, you know, just one of those cheap plastic trays uh, with ice cubes made out of distilled water. And I found that one ice cube in about 500 milliliters of water will drop its temperature four degrees and, you know, as soon as it melts. Something you can experiment with. The other thing, the microwave over in the break area is really handy for warming things up, you know, 10, 15 seconds. You'll warm, you know, warm it up a few degrees if you need to. So I'm gonna go ahead and mix up my developer. I'm gonna, I gotta wait a second here for the water to stabilize and get down to temperature. While that's happening, whoops, that's a brand new bottle. I'm gonna use my, my older bottle and we're mixing a ratio 14 to one. I got my cheat sheet up here. So I need 32 milliliters of developer. I'm gonna get 450 milliliters here. 
Okay, now I'm just going to dump that in. I have the habit of cleaning out the graduate with that. And I put my gloves on here now that we're getting with the chemistry. Um, some people will wear gloves when they're uh, doing the loading the film holders with the idea that it keeps them from getting any oil or any fingerprints on the negative and maybe they feel like they have a little better grip, keeps them from scratching or whatever. That's just something you'll have to figure out how you want to do it. Um, I always rinse everything right after I use it so that I know that it's rinsed. Okay, so now again, we've got the fill drain. I'm just going to pour this into the fill side quickly and smoothly. I like to hold this at a bit of an angle. It seems to let it flow in a little easier. Get that in. I always tap it a couple of times, put the caps on. I'm starting the timer. You want to be consistent with how you start the timer. Um, I'm squeezing the tank from the top here just a little bit. I can see that liquid come up about a half inch or a centimeter. I'm going to tighten this down. And now we're going to start agitating. Now I'm going to agitate for 15 seconds to get started here. And you notice how I'm agitating on the long axis. You do not want to ax you do not want to agitate, you know, going this way. I'll show you that in a second here. You do not want to agitate, you know, over the narrow axis. The reason you don't don't want to do that is if you do, the liquid is going to flow through the baffles in the uh, fill drain chamber and you can get flow you know, flow uh, marks on your negative. So always agitate over the long uh, axis. Also, I come up here, um, watching my timer, I'm agitating every 30 seconds. You notice I'm agitating quickly, um, holding it for just a fraction of a second and uh, for 10 seconds there. The, a couple comments on agitation. Um, one thing, you don't want to overfill the tank. The reason you don't, for several reasons. One, if you overfill it and you put the lid on, and, well, it's, as you overfill it and you try to do the squeeze play, you already got the lid on. As you try to do the squeeze play, before that, the water, the liquid can um, get past the seal and it will drip a little bit. A bigger issue with overfilling it is the real um, mechanism that's doing the work here is the air bubbles that are, or the big air bubble that is inside the tank. I mean, if you ever take a bottle of soda or just a, a bottle of liquid, um, if you were to put food coloring in it and you just turn it upside down, you'll notice, you know, if, you, if that food coloring is just in one, hasn't dispersed yet, you'll notice that the, um, the water doesn't move. It's, uh, it will stay, stay in place because it's not attached to the side of the container. So uh, it's the air bubble that's flowing in and out of, you know, up and down in there that really helps with the agitation. Let, so one question that comes up is, why are we agitating? And when I was younger, much younger than today, uh, I was a kid, okay, I was in eighth grade. I thought we were agitating. I had been told, well, you have to agitate correctly for even development. And yes, if you're agitating, you can, if you're doing it wrong, you can get uneven development, especially in some of the older tanks and stuff. The real reason that we're agitating is to control contrast. Because what's actually happening here, and again, when I was a kid, I thought, well, when you're agitating, uh, no development's taking place because the liquid's moving and, you know, it, it can't work on the film. Well, you can't move the tank fast enough to stop that process. So the development continues while I'm agitating, but what's really happening, okay, so the, the part of the negative that's got the highlights on it is gonna need a lot more silver plated out, you know, to show those highlights. And if you let the tank just sit there, that developer in contact with that part of the negative is going to get exhausted and it's gonna stop the process. By agitating, I'm bringing fresh developer in contact with the face of the na surface of the negative so um, you can get the highlights to come out. So basically, the agitation will have a huge impact on the contrast of your negative. Typically, the more agitating you do, the more contrasty the negative is going to be. And that's something you have to experiment with 
and you know you'll need to take a look at what works and, and figure out what works for you. Um, a couple of things I'm not doing. You may have noticed I did not pre-soak. Uh, pre-soak is not recommended by any of the modern manufacturers of black and white films. Color is another ball game. Um, but it used to be this deal with pre-soaking where you'd fill the tank or you'd submerge the film in water for 30 seconds to a minute before you put it in the developer. The idea being you get you prepare that surface for uh, absorbing the developer. And what they found, especially with the modern films, hey, things have changed in the last 75 years, right? Um, the modern films have a thinner emulsion. They, a lot of them have added a dispersion agent that helps the developer penetrate the um, emulsion evenly anyway. The other thing I'm not doing here is a water bath. Uh, you'll see especially uh, people using the stainless steel tanks or some really thin plastic tanks that they'll have a water bath and they'll be constantly putting the tank back in the water bath uh, to hold the temperature. Well, I'm not worried about it for a couple of reasons. One, uh, it's the average temperature that matters, not the absolute temperature. And you know how this tank behaves. We have a whole uh, blog post on it, a whole bunch of fancy charts and stuff. And if you were to cut this, okay, so backing up to those old stainless steel tanks, just holding those tanks, you know, picking it up to agitate it, you could add temperature, you could raise the temperature of the liquid just, you know, from holding it in your hands. The SP445, if you were to cut it apart, and we have, you'd see that it's almost an eighth of an inch, it's over two millimeters thick, and it's a real heavy plastic, it's a very good insulator, and it just doesn't change temperature that much or that fast. Now we're going for seven minutes, so I got about a minute left here. Um, the other thing I'm not using, and, and go read that article and you'll see about how that temperature stuff works. The other thing is, I'm not gonna reuse the developer, I'm gonna be pouring it out here. And the reason I'm not reusing it, and to be honest, you probably could, you could probably do three tanks off of this developer, um, especially early on if when you're just getting started and your exposure isn't that perfect and you're still trying to figure things out, you probably won't notice the difference. I wanna take as many variables out as I can and I wanna lower the risk as much as possible and especially at a ratio of 14 plus one, the, uh, the cost of the developer just isn't that big of a deal. So I only use it one shot. Uh, variables, you know, the number of variables that are in, okay, so now I'm at six minutes past 6.30. That was my last agitation, so I'm going to get ready to pour this out and uh, get the caps off. We have 10 seconds to go here, and I am going to, okay, so I'm going to save some of this for later. I don't want to talk about it. Dump this out. Now, I'm dumping the water in here as my stop bath. I like to do it three times. One is probably enough. What this is doing is diluting the developer so effectively um, that it basically stops the development process um, almost instantly. And I get the developer out of there so that it won't contaminate the all the water out. So now I'm going to pour in my fix. A little much in there, but we'll be okay. Squeeze it. I'm going to restart my timer. We're going to fix for about three minutes. A couple comments fixing. Uh, you'll want to test your fix, oh, I don't know, every three or four tank fulls. The easiest way to test it is just take a, a piece of scrap film that's been exposed but not developed and drop it in a beaker of fix. And, <coughs> excuse me, and what you're going to see, it, it, you, and time it, it should uh, go completely clear in about, you know, 25 to 40 seconds or so. I'm not real concerned about time or agitation um, intervals when I'm doing the fix. Some people agitate continuously. Some people will agitate once a minute. I, I, I don't think it's all that critical. I saved the developer 
And you can see it's this bright green now. And that's because what that is, is a combination of the dye that is in the emulsion to improve the speeds and stuff, but it's mainly the what's called the anti-halation dye that's on the back side of the film. A lot of people don't realize this, but sheet film almost always, as far as I know, always has gelatin on both sides of the negative on, on, on that plastic sheet. Uh, one side, the emulsion side, holds the silver halide compounds and a bunch of other magic chemicals to capture the image. The back side, they have um, this anti-halation dye. And what that does, light coming through the negative will get blocked by that dye so it doesn't reflect back off of your film holder in the camera and um, cause halos on the uh, negative image. The other reason they put the gelatin on both sides, I think the original reason they did it is mechanical. If you only had gelatin on the face of the, on the emulsion side, when it got wet or as it dried, it would curl really badly. And so by having gelatin on both sides, um, as, it wet, as it gets dry, it will stay flat. So um, anyway, that's what this is, is the anti-halation dye. And, and this has been one of the bigger issues that we've had with probably oh, one or two percent of our users reporting that the anti-halation dye didn't wash out and that the negative, they could see the patterns of the film holder on the back of their negative or the um, negative even stuck to the film holder. And after years of trying to replicate it, we finally uh, were able to replicate it about six weeks ago. Uh, we traced it down to a actually a water quality issue. Um, and we talked about this before with the softened water. You do not want to use softened water. Um, it will cause, um, it can cause that negative to stick because it's softening or doing something, we don't quite know what yet, doing something to the uh, gelatin on the back of the negative. So here's where the funnel comes in handy. We're going to save this fixer to use again. Now, there's the traditional method of washing your film, and we need to wash all that fixer out, okay, because otherwise, um, over time, it will um, destroy the image, damage the image. So we want to get it all out. I like to do three rinses right away. There, there's two techniques that you can use. You can put it in a, just let running water, um, and let it run for 10 minutes or whatever it takes. And there are fixer removal pest kit, you know, re residual fix um, test systems out there you can use to test the negative to see if you got it all out. Um, not a bad idea. Um, but anyway, we use a technique that has actually uh, been around a while, it was advocated by Ilford years ago, where I'm going to fill this. And, you know, I rinse it three times, and now I'm just going to agitate it the first time here for about 30 seconds. So that was the 30 seconds. And when I'm filling the tank like that, I usually just wait until I can see the water or the liquid come up in the other, in the vent hole. Um, there is a... Uh, um, measure a uh, liquid level tab in the fill drain hole as well. So I'm just going to keep agitating this. When we're talking about washing film, you know, a lot of people have the idea that it's a power washer. And we have another article on this as well you can look up. But uh, it's not. It's not. You're not power washing your driveway. You are, it's more like soaking a uh, dirty pan in the sink. Because what's happened is that fixer has uh, penetrated and uh, been absorbed into that gelatin emulsion. And we need to get it out of there. And the only way you're going to get that out of there is to soak it. And I won't go into all the chemistry with it, but if you remember, if you've ever taken a, a chemistry class, we'll talk about ionic concentration where the, the ions, you know, the fixer molecules, whatever, in the emulsion, they want to balance out with whatever is in 
the rinse water around them. So, you know, you just have to let it soak. And once the, once the rinse water gets uh, saturated, or once it, once it matches the concentration that's in the film, let what's left in the film, you're not gonna get any, no more fixers gonna leave, so you gotta change the water. But anyway, we're gonna keep doing this. Um, I'm gonna go about every minute now because we've removed a fair amount of fixer already, so it will just take a little while it just takes time for that fixer to leave the emulsion and you know even with the uh, constantly running water you're not uh, you're not it, it, you know faster you run the water isn't going to matter is what it comes down to and this technique uses a little less water and I think you actually get a, a, a better wash out of that Okay, so as we finish up our uh, wash, I want to talk a little bit about leaking, about the tank leaking. Um, if your tank is leaking at all, then something's wrong. Most likely, I would I'd say the vast majority of the comments or the requests we get or questions when people are talking about leaking is they haven't seen the squeeze play. You know, I'm squeezing the tank, tightening the lid, letting go. Um, they haven't seen the squeeze play video. That solves 90, 98%. We have had, I would say after that, we've had a few bad O-rings, um, which, speaking of O-rings, it, it's not a bad idea to have an extra run around, I, I mean, a, a buck, but don't order 10 of them. We, we've had people do that, and the truth is the uh, O-rings have a shelf life of about 10 years, and the first, I'm trying to remember, I think the first O-ring on the first, prototype film tank, I ended up replacing it after, I, I don't know how many hundreds of tank pulls of film went through that before we ended up replacing it. It was probably a year and a half, two years. So if you have an extra one around, you should be covered. I think we've washed enough here. Um, oh, the other thing that we've seen on the leaking side is uh, occasionally a bad cap. Uh, occasionally this top lip isn't uh, smooth enough. But we have a video on that and we have other articles on that you can go look at. So I'm gonna use our H2O flow. I'm gonna put in just a couple of drops, about four drops. You don't wanna overdo it because you can get what's called differential drying where you have too much of the, of the wash agent or rinse agent in there. So for this I use distilled water so I don't have any or reduce the mineral spots on my negatives. I'm just going to fill that up, put the caps back on. And for this, I'll just agitate continuously for about 30 seconds. Another thing to think about, um, or be sure you do, is get a notebook and record everything that you're doing. You're gonna be amazed in the future, surprised maybe, by how often you wanna go back, you, you wanna know what you did, and you wanna go back and figure out how you did something or how you didn't do it so you can do it again or not do it again. So anyway, we've got our, the, the rinse agent in there to get a spot-free negative. I like to take the lid off and I'm going to remove the negatives while they're still in the liquid. I think that's the simplest. Oh, we have an image. Don't know if you can see that. I've got my fancy drying rack here. I'll just clip this up. Let it dry. Now this I'll just dump out and I will rinse everything out here. And just leave it here to dry. Um, so that's the basic process of developing film with the SP445. Um, everything that we've talked about is available on our on a PDF that you can download. Doesn't have all the you know insightful, snarky editorial comments in it, but all the basic information is there. 
course, if you have any questions or comments, uh, send us emails. Uh, contact information is at the end of the video down below. So um, appreciate hearing from you and look forward to seeing some of your images on social media uh, or, Flickr, or Flickr group or wherever.